Mr. Boyd, finally. I was starting to wonder if you were going to spend the night. Shut your mouth. Mr. Boyd, listen, I understand you don't talk much. I get it. After all, you would never have... Well, you wouldn't have been able to do what you've done if you were a chatterbox. But I'm not asking you for a big speech. I'm not asking you to give me a master class in corruption. <laughs> oh, nothing like that. I'm, I'm only asking for one small story about the DeVroom painting. The newspapers never gave out too many details since the investigation was ongoing. But what's the difference now? What's left to hide? The, the painting couldn't be found, right? You, you made extra sure that it couldn't be found. <laughs> well, let's... Let's drink a beer sometime. No, not today. No, uh, tomorrow. Or, or the day after. Or, or the day after the day after tomorrow. Just whatever's good for you. You see, I, I'm really interested in this. How did you pick that job? I mean, what did you want with that picture? I mean, that one in particular. It's, it's, it's a pretty specific choice, you know? It's a, it's a controversial artist. The critics don't agree. I've never heard of corrupt officials stealing paintings. They all take bribes, just, just bundles of money and paper bags, you know. Of course, I'm not comparing you to those ordinary rotten geezers. <laughs> not at all. I, I just wanted to say that even though I don't know all the details, I see that you've got your own style. Whether you realize it or not, that's why the press called you the Caesar of corruption. You can find lots of kings of corruption in the newspapers. as a new one every month, but I've never seen a Caesar. Because Caesar... That's not about the scale, but the style. Style is everything, right? Please, Mr. Boyd. Why on earth should I get into the car with a stranger? Given your history, I'd imagine that you often had to get into a car with strangers. Back in Freeburg. Freeburg is different. Is it really so different? Absolutely. Friendlier? Warmer. Well, that's not saying much. Anywhere is warmer than here. How? Excuse me? How did you know who I was? How many ads were there? Ads? Well, I'd be willing to bet that when you came here, you went looking for housing in the newspaper ads. How many ads did you look at? I don't... I don't know. Maybe a dozen. But you chose this house. Why? Because it, uh... Because it stands away from everything. Well, that's a reasonable choice. Unfortunately, the neckties choose their houses by the exact same principle. They stash their goods in isolated houses until they can find a big buyer. But they don't settle into the house. They let someone else rent it. It's safer that way. Look, I'm not interested in how these neckties do business. I just want to know how they found out my real name. I'm not a big fan of drug dealers, Mr. Boyd, but I have to give them their due. Many of them are amazingly smart. Much smarter than, well, smarter than your average drug dealer, you know. And the man who was appointed to watch your house, Arthur Sherman, well, it turns out he's quite the brain. He even went to college. Can you imagine? Arthur is so clever that when he realized that you're Jack Boyd, he didn't report it to his bosses. You see, the Ties are a wandering gang. Yesterday they worked in Ripton, today they're here, tomorrow they'll be somewhere else. they just shoot you to be safe and that would be the end of it. But Arthur is clever and he knew how valuable the information was, so he did the clever thing and brought it to me. But how did he know who I was? How exactly? Ask him yourself when you get the chance. Oh, looks like we've arrived. Mr. Boyd, are you coming? Are you completely out of your mind? I'm a wanted man. I shouldn't be showing my face in public, even if it is old and shaggy. Come on, Mr. Boyd. There's only drunk pigs and sweaty strippers in there. Nobody will even look at you. Don't you want to drink a mug of draft beer for the first time in months and burp loud enough that everyone hears? Aren't you tired of hiding? Don't you just want to be an ordinary person? You saw where I live. Now I want to see where you live. Don't you think that's fair? 
Okay, you win. But I'll never believe that you don't miss letting loose. That's not the only thing I miss. Not the only thing, and not the main thing. I understand. Well, here's where we live. What? We can't go inside? Well, I didn't go into your house. I stood a hundred yards away. Now we're even. Don't you think that's fair? Arthur Sherman. I want to talk to him. Mick, bring Sherman here. I'm sure he must still be awake. Uh, Sean told me about this Captain Britt Carter of yours. Now, if you want... It I... won't be a problem. You sure? I can manage. If you have any difficulties, just let me know. I could... well... And I thought you were a smuggler, not a butcher. I don't like the word smuggler. Then maybe you shouldn't smuggle. Well, I'll put it this way. I don't like what you mean by the word smuggler. You must be right. Freeburg and Sharpwood are very different. What kind of goods came through Freeburg? Automatic weapons? Heroin? People? I'll be honest with you, I can't brag that I never had to trade in the first, second, or third, but my most popular product is canned soup. Mushroom soup comes in a little red jar. Now this is coming from a man who spent over 30 years eating a tasteless soldier's rations and not complaining. And I can assure you that this soup is the most disgusting meal in the world. When you pop open the jar with a can opener, this smell immediately bolts up your nose. The smell of despair, you know? It's impossible to suck down this vomit without thinking for even a second that your life is going nowhere. Sharpwood kids, when they grow up and leave this place for the rest of their lives, they'll always shudder when they remember this awful soup. But only the lucky ones, the few who manage to get out. The rest will live here for the rest of their days, eating smelly soup and then feeding it to their own children. Because without 12 cent soup, they'd all die. I give them this life, with the smell of despair. Bitter, but life. I don't know what cruel word to call what I'm doing, but I'm definitely not a smuggler. And I want that... Oh, there's your college boy, Mr. Boyd. Give me a cigarette. Still alive, Mr. Boyd. Oh, wow. How did you know who I was? Were you really hiding all that well? You hitchhiked on your way to Sharpwood. Well, not to Sharpwood, of course, but, but, but to Big Rift. And from there you walked on foot, but before Big Rift, a red-haired guy named Locke drove you. He picked you up at a bus stop 70 miles down the highway. Buses from Garensburg pass that stop every six days. In Garensburg, you spent two nights at the Stonewood Pecker Hotel. I called down there and had a nice chat with Mrs. Hopper, who... Just stop! So you're really that clever, Arthur Sherman? Proud of your little investigation? If I'd known this investigation would turn me into a hostage to rednecks playing toy soldiers, I wouldn't have stuck my nose in your business, Mr. Boyd. Hostage? Arthur can't leave the barracks. It's uh, for his own safety. In addition, he likes to live by military regulations. Isn't that right, Arthur? This shit you're pulling here isn't military order. It's the middle of the night, but everyone's awake! He's right, Mr. Boyd. <laughs> it's high time for bed. Hello? It's me. Are you awake? What do you think? Listen, I talked to Shapiro about Plunkett's situation. The truth is bad. He might not even make it to the end of the month. I, I don't know what he did wrong, but the dicks from the mayor's office don't even want to meet with him. But tomorrow, one of them will be considering your request. At least A.V. Carlos has to be there. Do you know what that means? I'm not... <sighs> 
Come on, Reeves. Plunkett needs to show off, to show them that he has everything under control. He'll need to puff himself up like a tough leader, the only thing holding the prosecutor's office together. Which means you're the ideal target for him to show them what a tough boss he is, you see? To to put it simply, whatever happens tomorrow, just nod and don't say anything except, yes, sir. And hopefully the blowback won't get out of hand. Lana? Are you still there? (laughs) You'd really like that, right? For me to always say, yes, sir, and that's it. Lena, what are you talking about? Look, I, I, I am trying to, well, sort of like trying to save you. Don't you get it? Good night, Reeves. Before we begin, Miss Berman, I should note that Mr. A.B. Carlos and uh, Mr. Ronald Atticus, representing the city administration, have been good enough to join us. And Judge Hawkins has also kindly agreed to attend. Uh, The rest of these gentlemen, I believe you already are familiar with. Thank you, Mr. Plunkett. I'd like to start with... If you will allow me, Miss Berman, I will begin. I'm still in charge, aren't I? I... Yes, Mr. Plunkett. I didn't mean to... I, I just... I would like you to answer a few background questions that will help us understand uh, your investigation into the case of Jack Boyd. Of course, I... Of course, but I just What's don't... so interesting about him? Sir, you ask me why I want to catch Jack Boyd? In my opinion, it's obvious that... No, Miss Berman, I did not ask you why you want to catch him. I asked why you're interested in him. Sir, I'm not sure I understand the question. Oh, well, in that case, allow me to phrase the question more precisely. You like Jack Boyd because with him, you don't feel lonely. As you said in a telephone conversation on September 19th of last year, or maybe because you consider him energetic and full of strength, as you said on another call four weeks later. The whole point is that... Mr. Plunkett, sir, before you go on, I think it must be said that... You know, Miss Berman, I am a man of conservative upbringing. I always imagine there are certain obligatory rituals and relationships between men and women. Going to the movies, meeting at the cafe, walking in the moonlight... But I see that's just boilerplate romance compared with these touching transcripts. You've quite convinced me that even over the phone, you can uh, create a very close bond with someone. So close, in your case, that it creates an obvious conflict of interest. And although your connection with Mr. Boyd didn't end under the best of circumstances, I don't think I need to explain how grossly you violated professional ethics, and even perhaps the law. Sir, I'm not... How? How did you... Isn't this the work of the prosecutor, Miss Berman, to know a little more than the others know? Information is our weapon, haven't you heard? I'm sure everyone in this room will agree. Do you think I would have reached my post if I couldn't gather information and use it at the right time and place? Everyone here understands perfectly what I'm talking about, I assure you. And I have little doubt that you understand as well, Miss Parman. Now, going against a person with information is like going against yourself. A young lady with ambitions simply cannot help but learn these common truths. Mr. Plunkett, there's something... But even truisms are sometimes worth remembering, are they not? If you'll just let me explain... I believe we're finished here, Miss Berman. 
You are suspended from all current duties. Your future will be decided by the disciplinary committee at a special meeting on February 2nd. Meanwhile, you're free to go. We don't need to detain our guests any further. I think they've heard everything they need to hear. Forgive me, Captain Carter, but this is important. Don't worry, honey. It's okay. I, I haven't had time to fall asleep yet. You came to wish me luck. I have leads on a number of major cases that I wanted, that I've dreamed of doing. Someone selling old weapons that they're bringing in from Ripton. Someone else is trying to... Look, it doesn't matter. You can read it all right here. The point is that we've got a lot of evidence against some small-time criminals, relatively small-time, of course, but I wanted to use them to get to bigger fish. Lily, there's uh, only one day left. Uh, I, I don't have any time to get to the, the big fish. And you don't need to. Just arrest all of these people, arrest them, and win. Uh, your, your father would... he would have laughed if he could hear this, but, uh, I... well... I, I'm a gentleman, my dear. Just win the stupid competition, Captain Carter. What? I forgot to give you your parking pass? I have my pass. Didn't Jesus tell you not to drink? That's right. I don't drink. I already went through that ordeal, but you... no. Well, it's nothing to be ashamed of. Oh, I'm not ashamed. You can be sure of that. You know, it's hard to handle some things alone. And sometimes, help comes from somewhere you wouldn't expect. You can say that again. When I needed help, it was an old man named Tarek Palm, former pastor. They say he was kicked out of the church because he went crazy. I don't know the whole story. Maybe he lost his mind, but he sure didn't lose his instincts. He immediately saw the two things that were ruining my life. Lies and stubbornness. So he... Uh, <laughs> he locked me in the basement. Lost his mind? Must have been a smart guy. He locked me up in the basement with the Bible, the Koran, and the Torah. And he told me that he didn't care what I was going to believe, but every righteous man, whatever he believed, had to go through these three steps. And the first step is when you choose principles over honesty. And the second step is when you choose honesty over principles. And the third is when you don't need to choose at all because honesty is your only principle. Now, old man Palm said that 
he would bring me water every morning and ask, What stage are you on, son? Three weeks later, I answered, On the third, father, and he let me go. I, I was a, a changed man, but I lied about the third stage. I was still stuck on the second one. Well, I guess that makes you a cheat, and I'm not going to play cards with you. Don't even ask. The competition between us, it... Uh, oh, I mean, maybe it was stupid, but... Uh, <laughs> it was only stupid when you won it. Um, I cheated, Jack. I won because Lily helped me, brought me a, a pile of papers with, with lots of leads, and somehow this one was stuck in with the other papers. Of course, I, I was going to phone it in right then and there, but then I thought, what will happen if I call? The feds will arrest you. Uh, but what then? Would that be the end of it? <laughs> no, no, of course not. Uh, there'll be reporters, uh, there'll be some kind of investigation, and everyone will be on the hook. Lily, the other cops, uh, our ordinary townspeople, everyone. It's hard to imagine how this would hit our town. Jack, I'm sure you understand. Uh, Lily he wanted me to take things over gradually, you know, so we could work together for a few days and keep everything calm, right? But you could keep things even calmer. You, you can leave early in the morning. You can disappear, and no one else in Sharpwood will ever hear from you. It'll be like you were never here, like you got off the bus, uh, you took one breath of icy air, and immediately decided you needed to get out of here. I mean, after all, who would hide from justice in a freezer? Don't be ashamed, Jack. Drink up. You haven't got through this yet. I have. I need to talk to Liam Henderson. I know, but it's important. Yes, I'll hold. Captain Carter caught a bunch of scumbags lately. And he made a lot of enemies. Any one of those cocksuckers could have decided Anyone that... Anyone could. Anyone could. Anyone could have. But someone did. Anyone could, but someone decided. How did I let this happen? I... Uh... We... We will try to find... Of course we'll try, Jack. Of course we'll try. Uh, the one who did this will be punished. I have no doubt. You have no doubt. Of course you have no doubt. The person who did this has to be punished. What else could happen? Lily, uh, we did everything we could. You did everything you could. Of course. 
Even more. I did more. More than necessary. More than this fucking town can take. Did something happen? I saw the file. Captain Carter's. Captain Carter's murder. So that's how it was. Everything points to this, Lily. Everything points to this, and we have no reason to doubt that- You have no reason to doubt. I have no reason to doubt. You're a cop, a very experienced cop. Much more experienced than I am. You have captured hundreds of criminals. You are a professional. You conduct an investigation. You've assembled all the facts. You wrote a report. You did a great job. You did a great job. You did everything right. What is there to doubt? Tell me, Victor. Tell me honestly. Are you a human being or a robot? Huh? Right? Or are you sure? Have you checked? Because it seems to me you have a set of programmed commands instead of brains in your head. Ever consider showing a little bit of flexibility? Just a little bit, huh? Ever consider that selling butter and selling gasoline isn't the same thing? I... Well, listen... Listen to me, Victor. Listen to me a second before your tiny electrical brains run out of batteries. When you sell him butter, you sell him a delicious breakfast. A person can live without a delicious breakfast. Yes, most people in this fucking town haven't even heard of a delicious breakfast. When you sell him butter, he's in a position to bargain. Because if he doesn't have butter, he'll smear his toast with clay. And by God, I swear he will eat it with no less pleasure. But when you sell him gasoline, Victor, when you sell him gasoline, you sell him him his business. You sell him the entire meaning of his existence. Because, Victor, if he doesn't have gasoline, he'll have to shut down his gas station. And if he closes his gas station, he won't have butter or toast on the table. And in fact, he won't even have a fucking table. Because his creditors will take away his whole fucking house. And a man needs a fucking house so that he can have a place to put his fucking table. You got the logic, right? Now see if you can digest it with your fucking electrodes or whatever you usually think with and call me back when you come to an agreement on the price. Ah, you're already here. I'm sorry, Jack. It's a busy time of year. I gotta sit by the phone all day. I can call you Jack, right? Then why am I asking? I'm already calling you Jack. <laughs> Let's sit down. We could go to the bar, by the way. I'm waiting for a call, but I could... It's fine here. You sure? Well, as you like. That's what I love about Sharpwood. Even if I forget to put the beer in the refrigerator, it'll still be cold. Here, you can help yourself. Hmm, doesn't look like beer, does it? Well, what is it? The infamous smelly soup? You should try it. Go on. Try it, try it. Don't be squeamish. Half of Sharpwood eats that soup every day. <laughs> no one's dead yet. <laughs> Not from the soup, anyway. Now I see. Hmm? Now I see why you'd say that anyone who lives on this soup would try to get out of here. Well, yes, but... Uh... But most of them stay. What do you think keeps them here? Family? Friends? Friends? But there's nothing easier than making friends. When did you arrive in Sharpwood? About ten weeks ago? Or was it eight? And look, you're already surrounded by friends. No, no, it's not friends. It's the enemies. Ask anyone in the city. Ask a poor man. Ask a rich man. Of course, if you can find a rich man. They all have them. Every one of them has a neighbor they can't stand. 
Well, how can you leave Sharpwood and allow your enemy to go on without you? So he could plant a cherry tree in your backyard? So he, not you, could buy drugs on discount? So he could grab a nice plot of land in the cemetery? No, no, no one can allow this. The enemy must be exhausted if it takes you your whole life. With the enemy, you need to fight to the last. Once you have an enemy, you're doomed. You can't think straight. Old Sheriff Wells was doomed. He couldn't stand drug dealers. I myself don't care for him, but Wells didn't count them as people at all, despised them more than murderers and rapists, and as soon as those fucking neckties appeared in the city, he knew right away that they were his enemies. Enemies which he must overcome, you see? And even if by some miracle he succeeded, what next? What other enemies would he have invented? And the performance we arranged for him that night? He had no reason to believe that there were ties hiding in that house. But one phone call, from this phone here, by the way, and he rushes off into the night to God knows where. You know what happened next. He threw himself into a hail of bullets, got two young cops killed too, though they had absolutely nothing to do with it. Sheriff Wells invented his enemies, and he paid for them dearly. So the policeman had to pay for doing police work. What? Jack, come on. I know we need the police. Of course we need them. There was a case here recently, a month before you got here, maybe less. A fellow named Rocco, he was a butcher here. His old mother Bertha went missing. And Bertha had either Alzheimer's or old age dementia, or is it the same thing? I, anyway, poor Bertha always forgot everything. Couldn't even recognize Rocco half the time. And then suddenly, she disappeared somewhere. So... What did our Rocco decide? Our Rocco decided that his mother was kidnapped by Eves Menke, another local butcher, his competitor, so to speak. No, just think, a man finds his mother missing, his old sick mother who can't remember her way to the toilet, and the first idea that comes into his head, his competitor kidnapped her. He watched too many movies, I guess. So what did Rocco do? Rocco picked up the hammer, went to Eve's Menke's house, cracked open his skull, then broke his brother's skull, then broke his father's skull, then went down to their basement shouting, Mom, I've come to save you. And the basement was empty. Of course it's fucking empty. And there he is, standing there. Goes back home, covered in blood, hammer in hand, and his mother is there, sitting in her armchair, quietly knitting. Walked around in the woods all day, then came back home. Doesn't even remember a thing about it. Now Rocco will be in prison for the rest of his life. But if he just called the police, if the cops had combed the forest looking for poor Bertha, nothing would have happened. So of course we need the police. Never imagine, Jack, that I think the police is my enemy. I don't invent enemies for myself. I won't repeat the old sheriff's mistakes. Unlike the new sheriff. What, you arranging a special performance for her, too? I could, of course, but what happens after that? Marino says that after Gail Greenberg's death, there's no first deputy in the department. So if the sheriff suddenly dies, anyone might take her place. And I do not need anyone. I need you. I'm sorry? You're working in the sheriff's department, unofficially, right? I think it's time to formalize your status. First deputy sheriff. It's a good start, huh? Why would Lily formally appoint me as first deputy? You're not listening to me at all, Jack. Lily invented an enemy for herself and will do anything if it means she can get even with her enemy. Believe me, run the ties out of Sharpwood and you'll get your post. She wouldn't think for a second. I'm not sure she... Uh... Just think, Jack, just think! The ties didn't just flood the city with drugs. Oh, no, that would not be enough. The ties killed her precious Sheriff Wells. Well, that's what she believes anyway. But would they stop at that? Oh, no. The ties killed Gail Greenberg. And was that enough? Not at all. Now the ties had also killed her champion, Captain Carter. As far as I know, Jack, you made sure poor Lily thought as much. You can be sure, Jack. Hatred for her enemy has all but blinded our sheriff. Like her predecessor. Like her predecessor's predecessor. Consider this a Sharpwood tradition. Suppose she agrees. Although I do not really believe she will, then I'll still need to deliver and take out these ties. Is that a problem? I thought you were an experienced cop. I don't even know where their headquarters are. But I do. I learned a lot from our distinguished young student, Arthur Sherman. 
The scholar couldn't be held in isolation without books. He traded all the valuable secrets of the insidious neckties for the Viscount de Bragelonne. Can you imagine? <laughs> Even if I can. I'll have us be Victor. Don't worry, Jack. She'll agree. You'll see. She'll agree without hesitation. <laughs> Call me when you made the deal. Just don't leave it too long. Here, little souvenir from Freebird. Hello. What? Why does he need so much? It doesn't matter how much he's willing to pay. It's physically impossible at that time. Jamie, Corey, great. Come help me move some papers from Sheriff Wells' office. A lot of papers and some other stuff, too. Come on, guys, let's get moving. Sheriff Wells' office? I thought we, uh, aren't like we not allowed to enter his office? You don't, you don't need to go inside. Just wait in the hall. I'll take it all out and you can help get it downstairs. I'll get some twine or something to tie up the stacks of folders. Sheriff Reed here? Yeah, we're waiting for her. She asked me and Jamie to come help with her. Hey, what's that? Mold? That? Oh yeah, that, that's black mold. Yeah, I can, I can see it's black. Has it been there for long? You just noticing that? <laughs> then you better not look at the ceiling in the dining hall. Well, it's all rotten, from one end to the other. I always think the thing is gonna fall on me, like it's a race. Can I finish my sandwich before the ceiling finishes me? <coughs> oh, oh man, yeah. Can mold can mold cause coughing? It's bad for your health, right? Some kind of toxin or something? What? <laughs> Hardly. Oh man. Feels like I've been breathing in garbage. When was the last time we had repairs? Repair? Are you kidding? This place has been falling apart for 40 years. Hmm. How old is this building? 80 years? Hmm. Uh, 122. <laughs> that old? Are you sure? You ever read the sign at the entrance? You think I'm the kind of person who reads dumb signs? Well, it's been right in front of your nose every morning for, like, how long you worked here. Eleven years? Going on thirteen. Thirteen years? And you never looked at the sign? Thirteen years and you never noticed the black mold on the ceiling. And I heard from your wife that for thirteen years you haven't, uh... Look, you want me to look at mold all these years? I don't even think it was there before. It used to be white mold. Now it's black. These are different types of fungus. When the temperature... Yeah, yeah, what's the fucking difference, black or white? I've never seen white mold before, or black mold. And the floor didn't use the creak. <laughs> Maybe we have termites. <laughs> I do not want to fall through the floor one day. Hey, you got a cigarette? Got a light? Uh, a light? Um, Sheriff Reed isn't going to be happy about smoking in the station. Well, uh, Sheriff Reed doesn't have to know everything, right? It's me. Yeah, already done. She agreed. Very. No, that won't be necessary. No, no, let Marino bring me everything in writing, then I'll do it myself. Yes. Excellent. <laughs> 